Wave parameters. There are many parameters that we could talk about dealing with the properties and behavior of waves. I'm picking a small set here because I think this set flows well together and the others we'll cover in following videos. Let's start with what I like to call the fundamental parameters. These are the permeability, permittivity, and conductivity. These are the parameters that appear in Maxwell's equations. So these are the fundamental ones that will describe everything about the medium. They really don't have anything to do with the wave. They're describing the medium. The other thing is they're not very intuitive. If you give me numbers for all of those, I can't really tell you what effect that's going to have on the wave, the speed of the wave, how quickly the wave will decay, things like that. I really can't tell that from mu, epsilon, and sigma, but those are the fundamental parameters. We then move over to everything else. And so from the permeability, permittivity, and conductivity, we can calculate a bunch of things. Now these parameters isolate specialized pieces of information, like for example, refractive index. This summarizes the speed of the wave. The impedance is summarizing the amplitude and phase relationship between E and H. Whereas if we look over here, we might think, well, conductivity, that's responsible for loss. Wouldn't that completely characterize loss? Well, if the conductivity is zero, we'll know that there will be no loss. But as soon as the conductivity is non-zero, yes, that contributes to loss, but then suddenly so do mu and epsilon in a very strange, complicated, non-intuitive way. But for example, we have the attenuation coefficient. All of the loss information that's encoded in mu, epsilon, and sigma will then be consolidated and isolated to a single parameter. So that's the really the advantage of these more intuitive parameters is that it extracts that information from mu, epsilon, and sigma. But make no mistake, these are not the fundamental parameters. There's things, these are things we calculate from an analysis. All of this starts, I think, with the historical wave equation. This is the wave equation that's been known since the 1700s. And so just using this generic psi parameter, that represents the disturbance, whatever the disturbance might be, right? If we have a string tied tautly at two different ends, that psi might be the vertical displacement of the string as a wave would travel down that, or the height of a ripple on water, or the pressure of air, or it could be an electric or magnetic field. So some kind of disturbance that would lead to a wave phenomenon. And so we have the Laplace of that, that's essentially a second order spatial derivative. And then we have this other term here, which is the angular frequency divided by the velocity of the wave. So the velocity information and frequency information is encoded in this parameter in the wave equation. So as I mentioned, that wave equation was known for a very long time. So along comes Maxwell, adds the displacement term to Ampere's law, and is able for the first time to derive the electromagnetic wave equation. Well then, comparing the two, suddenly now is a way to calculate the velocity of a wave from these fundamental parameters, right? This omega square mu epsilon, which up to now was just this strange collection of terms, well, that has to be omega over velocity squared. So we can simply set those things equal and then solve for velocity. And we see the speed of a wave is really just a function of the permeability and permittivity. And I should say, we're talking about electromagnetic waves here. This is not the velocity of speed or, or sound or anything like that. Velocity of an electromagnetic wave. Now in vacuum, the permeability is just the free space permeability and the permittivity is just the free space permittivity. And in a vacuum, this is the fastest that an electromagnetic wave could travel. So when people say the speed of light, really what they're talking about is the speed of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum. Even though technically when that light enters water, well, the speed of light would now be slower than the speed of light in vacuum, but we'll reserve the word speed of light, meaning the speed of an electromagnetic wave in vacuum. So this is the equation we had up to now for velocity of an electromagnetic wave inside of any medium. 
Well, if we're in vacuum, we just simply replace the permeability with the free space permeability and the permittivity with the free space permittivity. We now have a new expression for the speed of a wave, and that's what we call speed of light, and I call that C naught. I'm always going to use this not subscript here because a lot of times people write just C and they're really meaning that to be the velocity V that can actually change depending on the medium. Whereas the speed of light, this is fixed and it is a constant. It's the speed of an electromagnetic wave in vacuum. And by the way, this number is exact. There are no decimals here because we now base one second on the speed of light. So that is an exact number. Refractive index. The refractive index is the factor by which a wave slows down when it's propagating through some medium. So if refractive index is two, the speed is traveling, the speed of the wave is half what it would be in vacuum. If refractive index is three, the speed of that wave is one third what it would be in a vacuum. So let's pull out of this what refractive index would be. So the permeability, we're going to write as the free space permeability times the relative permeability. And if you're following the videos up to this point, that should be no surprise. And similarly, the permittivity is the free space permittivity times this relative permittivity or called the dielectric constant. So we start with this general equation for the velocity or the speed of an electromagnetic wave in any medium. And let's substitute in these two expressions for mu and epsilon. At this point, we can reorder the terms and sort the terms, and I'm going to pull the mu naught epsilon naught out here and the mu r and epsilon r over here. Well, at that point on the left, we can recognize this one over square root of the free space permeability times free space permittivity. That's the speed of light or speed of electromagnetic wave in vacuum. That leaves us with this other term. We are dividing the speed of light by this square root. Well, that means that square root, that is the factor by which a wave is slowing down inside of a medium. So this is how we calculate refractive index. Now, don't mess this up here. Remember, the, the speed has the free space permeability and permittivity. These are the strange numbers, 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 6, that kind of thing. But refractive index is calculated from these relative terms. These have no units. And so even after we take the square root, still no units, refractive index has no units, but it's calculated from these relative terms, not the ones that have the strange units. So in the end, we can write this as the speed of light divided by refractive index. That gives us the velocity of our wave or the speed of the wave, I should say. The next thing to remember here Unless we're in some kind of exotic medium, like a nonlinear medium or something that's moving very fast, the thing that's fixed here is frequency. So even though the wave may slow down, may change direction or do something else, the frequency of this wave remains constant. So here we're looking at an animation of a wave going from essentially vacuum into something with a refractive index of three. And we can visually see, okay, that's actually traveling forward at about a third of the speed as it is on the left. And we would expect that because it's a refractive index of one on the left, that's vacuum, and refractive index of three on the right. But if we track the time of these oscillations, that's what these two dots are doing, and I'm connecting them by this dashed line, those are going up and down at the same rate. So frequency is fixed, but the speed of the wave is changing. Now, since the speed of the wave changes, so does the wavelength. Notice it gets more compressed, the slower it's traveling. And so we've already written here that the speed of the wave is the speed of light divided by refractive index. But similarly, we can say the wavelength and the wavelength without the subscript zero. This is the wavelength that can change depending what medium it's in. It's the free space wavelength, that's a constant, divided by refractive index. I'll mention sort of one aside thing here. Uh, in my work, you'll find this very rarely where I use just lambda all by itself. And that's because when I see lambda in the literature or in a textbook, it's somewhat ambiguous and I don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes they mean the free space wavelength 
Sometimes they're talking about the wavelength that changes depending on the media, but they're just saying whatever the wavelength happens to be inside this media. And these are two very different wavelengths that we're talking about. And so I really rarely use just lambda alone because it's it's so ambiguous. I try to always use the lambda not, which is a fixed, it's a constant thing associated with the if you know the frequency you know the free space wavelength but then i also have refractive index floating around in my equations sometimes i want to make a point about things and you will see me use this occasionally but i try to keep that to a minimum so just be cautious about that from the animation on the last slide this shouldn't be any surprise but the speed frequency and wavelength of a wave are related through this equation v equals f lambda and this actually applies to any wave it could be a sound wave it could be a vibration on a string a gravity wave or an electromagnetic wave all waves follow this now if we're in a vacuum this v equals f lambda while the speed of the wave becomes the speed of light and the wavelength is the free space wavelength so this gives us a way to calculate the free space wavelength from the frequency or frequency from wavelength. And notice these two things are simply related through a constant, the speed of light that never changes. So in my mind, uh, it, this frequency and free space wavelength are sort of synonyms for each other. Yes, I know they're conveying very different things. One is cycles per second, one is the, the period of a wave, and I get that. But since they're just related through a constant that never changes, they're really conveying the same thing in my crazy mind, I guess. But from now, uh, it's possible to derive an expression for wavelength. So V, we understand, is 1 over square root of mu epsilon, but it's also equal to F lambda. Well, from that, we can come up with an equation to calculate the wavelength. And remember, this is not wavelength with the sub-zero here. So this is the wavelength that can change depending what medium it's in. And we can put that in terms of this ordinary frequency F or the angular frequency omega. Both these terms, unfortunately, are called frequency, but the ordinary frequency is cycles per second. This is what we measure in kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz. And the omega is the angular frequency. It's radians per second. Let's talk a bit more about how wavelength and the wave number are related. I probably have made this slide a bit more complicated than it needs to be, but here we go. When we were first deriving the wave equation, we had a definition of K that looked something like this. Well, I can write my permeability and permittivity as the free space terms times the relative terms. I can then separate those and put the free space terms under one square root and the relative terms under another. From there, I can recognize that this square root of the product of those free space terms is one over the speed of light. And also the square root with the relative terms, that is refractive index. So we have greatly simplified this group of terms and it's just omega times the refractive index divided by the speed of light. Now from there, we have the angular frequency related to the ordinary frequency two pi f. But we know f is the speed of light divided by the free space wavelength. The free space wavelength, we can write in terms of the wavelength that changes its size depending what medium it's in, simply by saying refractive index times the wavelength. Remember, not the free space wavelength, the wavelength that changes depending on what medium it's in. So now we can go back to this first equation. K is omega divided by speed of light times N. So we have that here. Well, we have an expression now for omega that we can drop in here. And that's the next step. Where's our expression for omega? Divide by the speed of light times refractive index. Now we can do some things and cancel some terms and it ends up, this is just two pi over the wavelength. And that's really the big aha or conclusion here. This wave number, the magnitude of that, well, this is just a scalar quantity. It is two pi divided by wavelength. When this becomes a vector quantity, it's the magnitude of that vector is still two pi divided by wavelength. So in my mind, this wave number here is conveying wavelength because the two pi is just a constant. 
So that's how my brain is programmed. I'm interpreting K sort of as wavelength. Now it's two pi divided by wavelength. It certainly is not equal to wavelength, but it's conveying the same information. And I, I think of it that way in my head. So this wave number can also be a vector. You can have a certain wave number in the X direction. You can have another wave number in the Y direction and another wave number in the Z direction. We live in a three-dimensional world, so there is no other dimensions here. So we just have these three components for the wave vector. The magnitude of this is still conveying the wavelength. It's two pi divided by wavelength. So when we're talking about a wave, we have transverse electromagnetic waves when we are in linear homogeneous isotropic uh, media. So that means the electric field and the magnetic field will always be perpendicular to K. And in fact, E, H, and K are all orthogonal and perpendicular to each other. So that's the wave vector. And it's a vector conveying two things. Magnitude conveys wavelength and the direction conveys the way that phase is moving. It's the, it's the movement of the phase fronts. It's the movement of the ripples, however you would like to look at that. So the first thing here, the magnitude conveys wavelength. So in this medium one, we're in vacuum or free space and we have some wavelength lambda sub one. I could have written that as lambda naught since we're in vacuum, it is the free space wavelength, but I just chose to stay consistent with the subscripts here. So we go to medium two, has a refractive index of three. We have some other lambda and it's less. And we could get that information immediately from the magnitude of their wave vectors if we knew the wave vectors. So in fact, two pi divided by the magnitude of the wave vector would give us the wavelength in each of the mediums. So the wave vector is changing in each of the mediums because the wavelength is changing in each of the mediums. Now, hopefully this doesn't get too confusing, but the magnitude of K can also convey refractive index. And in fact, I would argue it's doing this most of the time. And so the way I argue this is when frequency is known, that's when the magnitude of the wave vector conveys refractive index because if the frequency is known, then we will know the wavelength, the free space wavelength. And if we know the free space wavelength and the actual wavelength, we can get refractive index. So when frequency is known, the magnitude of K conveys refractive index. So here's how that works. So the magnitude of K is two pi divided by wavelength, but we could put this in terms of free space wavelength by writing a free space wavelength and then dividing the free space wavelength by the refractive index. So the refractive index ends up here in the numerator. So two pi times refractive index divided by the free space wavelength. Well, we have this ratio here, this two pi divided by free space wavelength, which gives us the free space wave number and this is just a constant when frequency is known. Remember in my sort of crazy twisted mind, the free space wavelength and frequency are kind of the same thing, right? Um, they're related through the, the speed of the wave. So anyway, now we're writing this magnitude of K as the free space K times refractive index. So when frequency is known, this is a constant, the magnitude will convey refractive index and we can get that information. This is actually going to become really important later when we talk about index ellipsoids. And I would argue most of the time, frequency is known. So yes, we can get wavelength out of the magnitude of K, but if frequency is known, we can get the free space wavelength. And since we can also get the wavelength, we can get the refractive index. So I don't feel like I did such a great job of explaining that, but hopefully this came across. Material impedance. The impedance is defined as the ratio of the complex amplitude of the electric field divided by the complex amplitude of the magnetic field. Picture it this way. You've got some medium that a wave is propagating through and, and pick some point in there. You have the electric field pushing on that medium. That medium and the coupling between E and H, that system will respond with some magnetic field. And that magnetic field can have a different amplitude and a different phase to the electric field. 
So it makes sense then that if we divide the complex amplitudes, the impedance can be a complex number. And so that shouldn't be a mystery. It's complex because both amplitude and phase of E and H can be different. So I think of the impedance as the balance between the two. So now let's write the magnetic field in terms of the electric field parameters, but utilizing the impedance. So let's go back and remember some things. We had a general expression for the electric field, which was this polarization vector times a complex exponential. We then substituted that into Faraday's law and then derived an expression for the magnetic field, but in terms of this wave vector, and the polarization vector. Remember, that was the amplitude and polarization of the electric field. And we had this one over omega mu sitting out here, and that was rather unintuitive, but we know that it's somehow scaling the magnetic field. So now what we'll do, we will write the wave vector as the magnitude of the wave vector or the wave number times a unit vector form of the wave vector. And we can do the same thing with the polarization vector. We'll write it as this complex amplitude E naught we've had plus a unit vector in the direction of the polarization vector. From there, we can factor out this K and we can factor out the E naught. So we still have a K cross P that's still going to give us the same direction that it's been giving us, but the magnitude of this is really being conveyed by what's going on out here. And that's because K and P will always be exactly perpendicular to each other. So since these are two unit vectors, this cross product, the magnitude will always be one, but it'll be in whatever direction the magnetic field will be pointed in. So outside here is solely what's determining the complex amplitude of the magnetic field. And so it's the beginnings of how we're going to derive an expression for impedance. Okay, so here's what we had on the last slide. We, we derived this expression for the magnetic field, and we said this term out here is the complex amplitude. So we now have an expression for the complex amplitude of the magnetic field given the complex amplitude of the electric field. Well, that puts us in a great position now to derive an expression for impedance. So impedance is this complex E divided by complex H. So we take our expression for complex H, put that in the denominator. We can cross off the E naught terms and we end up with omega mu over K. Now that isn't very useful, but we can do more with that. Remember K is omega times the square root of mu epsilon, right? So we can replace K with that. Now we see there's two omegas, we can cancel those. There's also two mu's. And so we can bring everything into the square root. We'll end up with a mu squared on the top, a mu, just a regular mu on the denominator so that we would cross this off and then that would no longer be squared in the numerator. And we have our final expression for the complex impedance given complex permeability and complex permittivity. So it's mu over epsilon, square root of that gives us this impedance and the impedance is sort of the balance between E and H. It's telling us how the amplitude and phase is affected. Well, here's a, now a way we can write the magnetic field. With that whole big expression, which was the complex form of H, we can now write that as one over the impedance. So if we just have K cross the ordinary P, so this has the information from the complex amplitude of E in it now, it's not the unit vector P, and then divide by impedance. So in my mind, I think this is a better way to more intuitively write the magnetic field and understand how the, the magnitude and phase of the impedance is affecting the magnitude and phase of the magnetic field, right? Uh, the bigger this magnitude, the smaller H will be relative to E. And as we add phase to this, well, it's actually subtracting phase from the wave. Now in free space, the free space impedance or the impedance of free space is the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught, which is 376.73 blah, 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 ohm. So almost 377 ohms is the impedance of free space. 
Now, numerically, if you do electromagnetic simulations, this actually becomes a big deal because this says E and H are three orders of magnitude different. And it's a little bit incorrect to think of H being smaller than E because they have different units and they're conveying different things. And that probably doesn't have so much meaning. But numerically, it definitely does. They're three orders of magnitude different. And if we're doing many calculations to do some kind of numerical simulation, if we're not careful, we could literally lose three digits of precision every time we add, subtract, multiply, divide, or do something with E and H in it. So that impedance actually does have pretty profound impact on how we do things numerically. That's not the point of this course. I just figured I would mention it. So let's look at a wave. And I've had to exaggerate the magnitude of H. As I mentioned, it's about three orders of magnitude less than E. So if I were to draw this really to scale, you wouldn't see the magnetic field. So you just have to pardon me a little bit there. But I did draw it a little bit smaller because it almost always is. So it's smaller. The H field, which is shown by the red wave here, is perpendicular to the electric field, which is shown by the blue wave. And also notice they're out of phase. And later on, we'll discover conditions that actually would lead to this being out, out of phase. But the short answer is if there's any kind of loss, that leads to E and H being out of phase. Otherwise, they stay in phase, but they're still perpendicular to each other. So I keep going back to this analogy. The impedance is the balance of E and H. It's the amplitude and phase relation between those two. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for using E Impossible. I want to create more videos and I want to continue to improve how electromagnetics and computation is taught online. To do that, it will really help me if you can like this video and subscribe to our channel. I also want you to know we have a lot more content that you may not be aware of. See everything we have to offer at eimpossible.net.